Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time and I'm here for my weekly this and that video and for those of you who are new or maybe you still haven't figured it out yet, these are a weekly vlog that I do keeping you updated on different experiments I have going on, linking you back to older videos I may already have out on some of these topics if you want more specific information that is individualized to those different topics to answer some questions that have come in in the past week and maybe even let you know of other videos and projects that are coming out later. So let's get on to the topics of today. So today I'm going to start using my off-grid dehydrator dehydrating liquids for the first time. I've been wanting to do this for years but until now I did not have any silicone trays that would work with my dehydrator. So if you saw a couple of my recent videos about dehydrators and the silicone trays or sheets, whatever you want to call them, with the lip on it so it's going to hold all the liquids in, this is for my Kasori. So even this rack right here is for my Kasori, my electric dehydrator. But I found out this morning, initially what I was going to do was use the silicone sheet on the stainless steel racks we got to go with this. Patrick built this dehydrator specifically to fit these racks. We found the racks at our local store and thought they would be perfect, so he designed and built this whole construction at old bed rails so it would work perfectly for these. But the good news is I found that even the Kasori racks will fit in here. They're just a little bit nar more narrow if I turn them this way rather than the other way because they're rectangular but it will stay in there just fine. The good thing about that is if I start dehydrating this stuff on here and I decide it's taking too long, uh, especially with the tomatoes, I can then just pull this out, go stick it in the Kasori and let it finish dehydrating that way. So this piece here, and I have a video just on this dehydrator, but that I'll link to down below, but I just want to show you. We found these cast iron grates at the dump and I knew they were perfect. This was originally meant to be used like this, but when I found I, these fit perfect right across the top, that did a couple of things for me. So if you go watch that video, I go into more detail, but I can use this at, to set things on when I'm doing the dehydrating next to the wood stove instead of on top. So I can have my coffee pot sitting there or whatever sitting on here. If I'm cooking on the wood stove, I can set bowls, pots, pans, whatever I need here. So it just gives me a nut, some more counter space in there by our wood stove. But I can also, when I'm using this on top of the wood stove, which I'm going to try doing today first, because I'm afraid next to the wood stove, it's not going to work quick enough to dehydrate the tomatoes that I plan on doing today. So I can actually set this on the very top. And then what that does, because even though we have a pretty good size wood stove, uh, the top of it, this opens this up in here so we can have the coffee sitting back behind it. I'll put a picture here so you can see what I mean. That way we can still reach through and pull the coffee out so that gives us more room to work with. So I, though sometimes I will do several racks in there and do some dehydrating on there as long as I don't need to get to anything in the back. Typically now when I do this on the wood stove, it's gonna. I try to only do one thing on there and leave it open. But I have a second rack like this that these stack on top of each other, so I can do de other dehydrating on that rack while I'm doing the stuff that I feel needs a little more heat and quicker drying time on top of there. So my plan is today, I've got a bunch of ripe tomatoes. If you saw last week's this and that video, a lot of these last week were green, were very, very green, and now they are very ripe. So I'm going to be processing them in the blender and spreading them out on the sheet here. So this is the so this is just going to be experiment. I'm only going to do one at for now on there so I can see how well it's going to work and then turning them into the tomato flakes. And the reason I keep them in flakes and I do not powder them is cuz tomatoes are one of those things that will turn to a brick in a powder form if you do not vacuum seal the jar after every use. This jar is my last jar that I'm filling up. So once this is full, I am gonna vacuum seal it and put it away and then continue to work through my open jar. But I don't have to worry about vacuum sealing between every use 
like I would if this was in a powder form. Now, while I'm still on the topic of dehydrating, I did get that brick of sharp cheddar cheese in. Um, I'm gonna be pulling it out of the freezer today and letting it thaw out, and then I'll start making the cheese powder out of that. I've actually been using this more and more, and nothing real specific, mostly just sprinkling it on stuff, and I'm happy with it. And no, it's not gritty. Uh, somebody mentioned something about being gritty and sandy. It's just coarse. It just didn't powder up the same way like the milk and the eggs that I powdered up, but it's still really good. And one of the things I've been doing is I'm down to my last big zucchini, and this is just some waxed fabric. Uh, I have an old, old video out on that. I do still sometimes use the wax fabric. And so I don't have a lot of room left in the fridge, but it's okay as long as you're working through something like that. So I just been cutting bits of the zucchini off and baking it every day. I have some for lunch. And I just put that wax fabric over the end just to kind of help keep it protected there since that's the exposed part. And then when it's all done, I put a little butter and sprinkle some of this cheese on there and it's really good. So I'm really anxious to see how much better it's gonna taste with the sharp cheddar that has more flavor. Now again, this is a mild cheddar. The more mild your cheddar is, whenever you're talking about using cheese in baked goods, you're gonna lose a lot of the flavor when you go to bake it. It's not just about the fat content. It's just, it's about something about when it's cooked or baked or warmed in any way, it tends to mellow out the flavor, especially if you're talking about a cheese that's already very mild to begin with. Typically for things like that, I use at least a medium cheddar, but I decided to try a sharp cheddar to really intensify the flavor of the cheese. So when I go to use it and making a sauce or sprinkling on whatever it is I'm putting it on, I can get even more of that cheese flavor. So I'll be starting that today. Hopefully by next week when I have my this and that video, out, I'll be able to give you at least an update on how the flavor turned out. And then again down the road, I'll be doing a video just on the cheese powder, how I make it, and how I've been using it. But I want to use it in some more things first, just like same thing with the egg powder. I still have some more experiments I want to do with it. I've been very happy with it so far. But anyway, I'll link to the egg powder video, which was another this and that, as well as the cheese one, which was another this and that from that last week. So I'm actually going to be linking back to a lot of this and that videos. But uh, anyway, in those I do describe how I did the dehydrating of all those things. So still talking about dried products. This isn't something I dried myself. I did de try dehydrating milk and it turned out really good. But since I have to buy milk anyway, and we always try to go for the organic milk, and it's, it's pretty expensive here anyway, it's just as cost effective for me if I'm buying milk for storage, for long longer term storage, to have some powdered milk that I purchased on hand and somebody had sent me an email a while back recommending this brand here, the Prescribed for Life, because they actually have the powdered whole milk in an organic variety, which I hadn't seen before. I had been using the Hoosier Hill Farms, which is actually really hard to get now, but it has an excellent flavor, and the Judy's, both which are don't have all the hormones and all that, both which have are just the milk, no additives like the Nestle brand puts in there. They put a lot of junk in there, so I don't recommend that brand. But this is the first time I'd seen organic, and now I'm seeing more brands come out with the organic milk, and I'm pretty happy with it. So right here is some milk I made up yesterday, because normally when I'm using powdered milk, I use it directly in baking. So I'll make sauces, gravies, and so on. Uh, use it for making the oatmeal instead of using the fresh milk, but I had yet just to mix some up to use on cold cereal. Now I rarely eat breakfast, but every now and then I do just really want a bowl of cold cereal and I've been wanting to try the milk in that. So yesterday I processed this up and then uh, tried it on a little bowl of cereal this morning because I wanted it to get good and cold in the refrigerator overnight. And I was pretty happy with it. it I'm not a milk drinker and so this, I never have been for as long as I can remember. I always hated the taste of just plain milk and I hated the powdered milk my mom used to use. It was that non-fat garbage, and I could not stand that on my cereal. Now, even the whole powdered milk is gonna still have that definite powdered flavor to it that you know what I'm talking about. I actually like it, and I actually don't mind drinking this milk, even though I don't really like to drink fresh milk at all. So, But I, I'll try it with stuff like this just to see what I think of the flavor. And I have yet to find a good 
whole powdered milk that I didn't like the flavor of when it came to drinking it. And then I tried it on the cereal today and was pretty happy with it. So I wanted to explain real quick, even though I plan on shooting a separate video about how to use dairy powders, I've been getting a lot of questions on this and it's really super simple. Typically your powders, when you buy them, they should say right on there how much you need. If you're dehydrating it, you can get a pretty good idea how much water you need to add by how much milky powder you end up having by measurement. So if you put a whole cup of milk on your dehydrator rack and once you got it all dried up and powdered up you only have maybe a third of a cup or a quarter of a cup left that should give you a pretty good idea of what your water to powder ratio is. But typically the way it goes when you're buying a powdered milk uh, and, and I'm just talking about milk in particular, not the cheeses and stuff. You're gonna, you're looking at about a quarter of a cup of the powder to one cup of water. And that's a pretty good ratio. But the thing that's great about powdered milks is by putting a, a heaping quarter cup of the powder into the water, and that will make it even richer. So you can adjust it to your flavor, or you can put it less if you don't like it quite so rich. So I did put a little bit more powder than a a quarter cup per cup in that. And then the other thing I wanted to show is that I don't buy juices like this very often, but sometimes I do. And this is the Santa Fe brand and they put it in glass bottles like this, which can be really nice if you're wanting to recycle. I found recycling these bottles for anything you're gonna pour in a liquid form like this, such as the infused water. You saw the picture I did of the calendula water from last week. Well, I made another batch and used one of these bottles for that. I'm like, why am I not doing that? Because it's they're made for pouring, right? And they have a smaller spout. So it makes it so much easier. So I put the milk, initially I put it in a quart jar or regular mouth because that's what I'm used to doing. And I'm like, what am I doing? And I pulled out another one of these jars I've been saving or bottles and it's perfect for pouring. That's what it's made for. So if you're wondering how to recycle some of those juice bottles, if you have glass ones, anytime you're going to make up a, some kind of liquid, whether it be a cold infusion, the powdered milk, or your own homemade juice, put it in bottles like this is perfect. Oh, and this jug of wine here is finished out, so I'm going to be straining it. Not all wines that you make have to be strained. It just depends on the fruit. Uh, it's, a lot of times you'll get a pulp in there that needs to be strained out. So whenever I'm making my grape wines from my own grapes and I'm pressing out the grapes, I still, I always end up with pulp in there, no matter how much I strain. So I'm going to strain that out and then I'm going to rack it. And uh, that will be my first jug of wine for 20, from my 2021 grapes. The rest I'm keeping in the freezer until I'm ready to make more. And if you want more information on how to make your own wines or meads, I have a whole playlist on that I'll link to in the description box down below, including the video on why you might want to start learning how to make wine or mead, even if you don't drink, because they have many uses outside of just drinking. Okay, a couple more things. So this I've been meaning to talk about for a couple of weeks, and last week I simply forgot, but... <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to get some more information from Tina before I promoted this product. But her and her sister make these uh, little jars of what they call Wabbits. And it's a product they make from rabbits and it's a food topper for your pets. And Cody, of course, loves it. So I put a little bit on his right on top of his food in the morning and he just wolfs it right down and very very healthy rabbit meat is a good choice for an addition so you want to make sure you understand it's not necessarily something you want to just feed them alone it should be in addition to whatever food you're giving them just to give them some more nutrients that are going to be really healthy so I'm going to put her contact information in the description box down below if you'd like more information you can email her and I went ahead and bought a couple more jars. She actually sent this to me, no charge, just so I could try it out. And then I decided, to, if nothing else, Cody loves it so much, it's a nice healthy treat that I can give him that I know is gonna be really healthy for him. And of course, if you raise your own rabbits, I'm sure you can do the same thing with your own rabbits. But if you don't, like we don't have rabbits, we just have chickens, it's the only farm animal we have. Consider emailing her and getting some more information from her. And then one more thing, this is gonna be another one of those things I shoot a separate video on, but I wanna say this because I've been getting this question a lot lately, or comments about putting bands on jars of dehydrated foods. And no, there's no concern of botulism when you're putting bands on jars of dried foods. 
I personally recommend putting the bands on tightly. And this jar is from 2015 and it is still sealed, but sometimes if you didn't get a really good, pull a really good vacuum on your jar, it can come unsealed in storage, even if it was sealed when you put it in there. And that's why I recommend putting the band on snugly. It doesn't have to be super tight, just snug so that if the seal comes undone, it's still gonna keep it somewhat airtight. It's not gonna spoil. Your dried goods aren't gonna spoil. In fact, I have a video coming out just on that. It's just that it's gonna help it keep it fresher and also prevent any accidents. So you go to grab the jar out you don't have a band on there but it came unsealed you might have stuff going all over the place so it's just an added protective measure but it's not the same thing as canning wet ingredients like you would do in a pressure canner or a water bath canning method and not wanting to put those bands back on tightly you can put them back on very loosely but you don't want to put them back on tightly and it's not that putting a band on is going to cause your food to get botulism what it is is that if a jar comes unsealed, and again, we're talking about wet ingredients, and it's possible botulism could get in there under that seal, and then it creates a false seal, which means when you go to take it off, you think it's still sealed, because it feels like, you know, you gotta maybe pry it off. You won't know if botulism's in there because it doesn't have any taste or smell, and you won't be able to see anything. But by having the band loose enough that air can get in there so that when the seal comes undone instead of causing it to create a false seal then you'll see mold growing in there and then you'll know it's bad that's what that's about that's not going to happen with your dried goods you're not going to get botulism from putting the bands on it's just it's not going to happen not with dried goods all right well that's it for my this and that for this week so don't forget to go down to click on either show more right down here before, below my channel name or if you're on a smart device that little gray triangle right over here so you can see all the videos and any other information i'll be putting down below and go ahead and share your thoughts on any of the things I brought up or even if it's something totally different you just felt like you wanted to say a little tip on this or that or the other thing that other people can come read your comments and we can all keep learning from each other. All right, well, thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.